Hi, I'm Patrick Coyle. I'm a core developer of PyMC3, and this is Probabilistic Programming Primer. I'm going to take you through an example of Bayesian change point detection. This is a very useful approach when when modeling, and and it's often when you're modeling, you'll want to have the ability to detect change points. Let's talk about some examples. You may be working with a DevOps team. And you may want to know things like when the server began to get overloaded. You may be working with a marketing campaign. You may want to know when it began to kick in. There's lots of examples and things like process control and manufacturing. You, know, you could be working with um, data from an oil refinery. You want to know when a machine began to underperform. Uh, or you may work with you know in a product team. And you may want to know when beginners of users um, uh, saw conversion rate begin to change. The example we're going to use is, uh, is from Jarrett, 1979, a book or a paper. Um, and it's a time series of recorded coal mining disasters in the UK from about 18, from 1851 to 1962. The number of disasters is thought to have been affected by changes in safety regulations during this period. Unfortunately, we also have a pair of years of missing data identified as missing by a NumPy mask array using minus 999 as a marker value. So next we will build a model for the series and attempt to estimate when the change occurred. At the same time, we will see how to handle missing data, use multiple samplers and sample from discrete random variables. So although this example is like a coal mining example, it's very, very similar to the kind of things you might encounter in a marketing context or in a manufacturing context. So the first thing is we, we're going to load up our data. The first thing you'll see is that I've imported NumPy as NP, I've imported matplotlib as .pyplot as plt, I've used both seaborn and um, I've used mask values from uh, from NumPy. You can see when we look at the data, it's a good idea always to look at your data, that you know most of the disasters are around the early years of the of the time series. You can see that as we get past world end of World War II and towards the nineteen sixties, the numbers go down quite rapidly. Our question is when did the safety regulation kick in? And there are probably numerous policy inventions, but we want to know when it all began to kick in. This could be um, when the advertising campaign began to kick in, or when the new product launch began to resonate with users. That, that no matter what problem you're looking at, this will be roughly the same. Occurrences of disasters in a time series is thought to follow a Poisson process, and we'll we'll talk a bit more about what the Poisson process is and later on. With a large rate parameter in the early part of the time series, from one with a smaller rate in the, in the latter part, we're interested in locating this change point in this time series, as perhaps related to changes in mining safety regulations. So our model is roughly this: you know, you've got a um, Poisson distribution, you've got um, RT is the rate parameter to Poisson distribution of disasters in year T. S is, what is the year in which the rate parameter changes. This is our switch point. You can, you can consider this a bit like a, you know, a direct delta function or, or an if statement, if you know what those things are. The rate parameter E is before the switch point. The L, the rate parameter after the switch point, and TL and TH, lowercase, sorry, uh, subscript are the lower and upper boundaries of the of the year T. The model is built much like our previous models. The major differences are the introduction of discrete variables, both the Poisson and discrete uniform priors, and the novel form of the deterministic random state rate. So you can see here, you know, Poisson distribution, and here's a few of the examples from the documentation. We'll just we'll just zoom out a little bit. You know, you can see that it has like you know it looks like kind of you know you see here from the different values of mu, it it looks like the kind of like counting distribution that you might get in these sort of uh, phenomena.
So that's the name of the game. So often the, the function is used to model events in a fixed period of time when the events occur that are independent. So we're assuming that these events are independent. We're assuming that all coal mining disasters are independently, you know, identically distributed. And the PMF, and that's a probabilistic mass function of distribution, is represented by this. So I hope this explains a bit about why we picked this Poisson distribution. One of the challenges in Bayesian statistics, and we'll see a bit more of this in the course, is you know choosing. There's a there's a certain amount of art to choosing your your which distributions you use. So without further ado, let's bring in the model. So you'll see this syntax. We have a, this with this context manager. If you know what that is, if you don't, you can you can ha look it up. I might talk about this a little bit later on in the course. We we wrap. In this with statement, so with pm dot model as disaster model, and we wrap all these these values right. We all these random variables. We have a switch point, you know, which uh, is a discrete uniform. So we're assuming we we have no real prior on when the switch point occurs. Um, we have a prior for our early and post switch uh, rates. The represented by an exponential function because it's a counting function and it's always positive. That's the other reason we picked this. Um, we uh, we introduced this kind of um, Poisson rates before and after current. And finally, our, our last and most important uh, you know, likelihood function is our Poisson distribution disasters, as we've already talked about. So let's talk a little bit about the logic for rate. The logic for rate is implemented here and switch, switch point greater than or equal to year, um, early rate and late rate. And it's implemented using switch and this is a Theano function and we'll talk a lot more about Theano later on in the course. PyMC3 is built on top of Theano and you can consider Theano to be similar to uh, TensorFlow. And it works like an if statement. It uses the first argument to switch between the next two arguments. So let's talk a little bit about missing values. Missing values are handled transparently by, by passing a masked array, or you could use a pandas data frame with NAND values when creating the observed uh, stochastic random variable. Behind the scenes, another random variable, disasters.missing value, is created to model the missing values. All we need to do to handle the missing values is ensure that we sample this random variable as well. This gives you an idea of how this works with PyMC3. Unfortunately, they are discrete variables and thus have no main, meaningful gradient. So we cannot use NUTS. NUTS is a no U-turn sampler and you can consider it a best-in-class sampler. But it needs a gradient. The reason it doesn't have a gradient is that we're dealing with non-continuous functions for sampling switch point or for the missing disaster observations. Instead, we'll sample using Metropolis step method, which implements an additive Metropolis hasting sampler, because it's designed to handle discrete values. Um, PyMC3 will automatically assign the correct sampling algorithms, and this is one of the best features of PyMC3, the ability to abstract away these choices for you. We'll talk a bit more about this in the course. We have an entire section devoted to talking about um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, but basically, NUTS is considered best in class. It's often the most accurate. It's you know it often will reduce um, the bias that you get in your in your estimates. It doesn't work for discrete problems, so I would use an older and less efficient sampler called Metropolis Hastings. Um, we'll talk about this more depth later on in the course. So without further ado, we're going to just um, run this, and you can see here that I've actually um, seen a, a an error. We haven't defined our discrete disaster model. So I'll just go up a little bit here and run this disaster model again, this uh, this with uh, this context manager with statement. And um and we're gonna generate the trace. Um and the trace is basically the results of your sampler. And you can see um that it's it mentions the metropolis step. Uh, the Metropolis uh, Hastings sampler working for disasters meet missing and working for a switch point. You can see also that it's applying four chains in four jobs. 
the reason you use four chains is it's a, it's a good idea to use multiple chains and look at all your answers in case there's something wrong with one of your uh, CPUs or one of your uh, random number generators. And I'm using four chains because I have four CPUs on my laptop. So, um, so if we look at the trace plot here below, we can see here there's about a 10 year span that's uh, plausible for significant change in safety, but about a five year span it contains most of the probability maps, so somewhere around here. The distribution is jagged because of the jumpy relationship between the year switch point and the likelihood, not due to a sampling error. And we can see here that if we look at the, um, we can see our hairy caterpillar effect, you know, as I talked about earlier on in our course. So let's wrap this up. Results, we can see that there's, um, a five-year span is most likely for the safety regulation changes between about 1888 and 1893. In your marketing example, you may have several days or months with some uncertainty over them. And hopefully this gives you a nice introduction to Bayesian change point detection in PyMC3. Not only were we able to build a, a, a good generative model, a generative model story or a phenomena, but we got some uncertainty in our estimate. So one of the key things about Bayesian statistics is that you think distributions, not point estimates. And here's a reference for uh, Orgy Jarrett. Um, that's all from me for now. Um, I'll be back to you later with another screencast. Thank you very much.